What's up, everybody? Today I've got uh, the self-proclaimed Africa's number one, possibly Italy's number one, even though and in Mob might disagree. At least number Italy's number two, and uh, an old school Magic top player apparently. I didn't know that. And he's as loved as much as he is feared. Mustafa Kanit. What's up? Oh, jungle. I'm good, I'm good. It doesn't matter. If I'm jungle Italian number one, then I'm number one, you know. Alright, okay, okay. So, um, apparently you were, you started off already kind of beating everyone in your neighborhood uh, at various different games and magic as well, like very young, at like uh, 11 years old, I think. Is that right? Yeah, uh, I mean, my peak in Magic was probably when I was 15, 14, but I never played the, uh, you know, like the official the, uh, format because uh, it wasn't really profitable and you had to travel worldwide. And back in the days, I had only Moroccan passport, so it was very an issue and they couldn't afford, like, the cards will change every year. So I focused more on the eternal format with all the cards and, you know, it was more profitable to me. I was making money every month. And uh, I was supporting myself with that money. So I would say my peak in Magic was probably when I was 15. And, and then I switched to poker straight away. Uh, but did you, uh, did, were you able to make any money with that? It, it, it still sounded like yeah. one of the... Yeah, I was making probably 400 bucks a month. But consider that in Italy is good money. That's like, know, like pretty uh, good. For... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, I had my friends going to the work, to the beach, 10 hours a day, like getting crushed and making 800 bucks a month where well, me i just played magic do something that i liked and i was making good money from it i you know i had a very tough childhood so i couldn't do anything that uh, wasn't profitable like i couldn't really play the game just to play the game often i would get borrow cards to play because i couldn't afford it but you know i was uh, I never ask my money money for my parents since i'm probably i don't know nine years old really? so it was always profitable to me yeah you had to fight. You had to, uh, you had to like fend for yourself at nine years old. Is that right? Almost. Yeah, I mean, I lived by myself at fifteen already. So like, he was always trying to make money, and I, it wasn't a decision. You know, it wasn't a choice. It was where life put me, and you know, I had many different problems, family wise and whatever. So you just try to get the best out of it, and at the same time, I didn't like the school system. I didn't see myself studying another 15 years to make a normal job, so I always liked card games and I, in Magic I already figured out that, you know, like if you play better you will make money mm -hmm. and that helped me to move to poker because like it was just more scalable and it felt like, you know, I could make way more money in poker. Even though it took me a lot of time to make good money, but I started straight away. Yeah, I have heard basically a number of Magic players switch basically to poker, like Z Justin and David Williams, I think maybe Ike Caxton. Yeah, as well. actually, David, uh, also Nacho, Barbero, Noah Boken, countless. Breen comes from Magic as well. Really? Um, so random. Yeah, yeah you, ha you have a lot of guys. But yeah, I guess like, yeah, I but... mean, I, I kind of did something similar, except there wasn't any money in it for me. But I, I, I was essentially one of the best at various different games. And you just take those lessons and you apply them to poker. Yeah, and that's where the podcast comes from. Winning the game. Actually, a big, uh, a big, big turning point in my career was like when I was fifteen, I believe. I had this big magic tournament in France, mm -hmm. so you know, I travel, I went to play, and uh, close to the top eight was a big field, you know, like so close to getting the most of it. Top eight is like final table in magic. Uh, I played against David Williams. Really? You know, and I was playing, yeah, yeah, it was a big turning point. I always laugh with him about this because uh, I see this guy, he was there, like, you know, you are at the end, so everybody's super focused. He didn't seem like he really cared. He was there playing for fun. I saw he had the hottest girlfriend I ever seen. And I was like, oh my God, what's, what's the deal with this guy, you know? And I already started to play poker. I was playing in my club in Italy. I was like working as a dealer. And then I asked a friend and he told me, oh, that guy actually is a poker player. He got second in the main event in Vegas, I don't know, three, four years ago. He won six million and, you know, he was in Monaco playing poker. And I was like, okay. <laughs> when I went back, I never played Magic again. I was like, okay, like, 
poker thing doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound so bad. Maybe I should focus on that, you know, like. <laughs> so I always laugh with uh, David about this. You know, I actually, told him many years later. Uh, um, actually, the funny thing is I started to realize poker does seem like more and more kind of a dream job in many ways, especially in comparison to many of the other different possible jobs. I mean, I remember uh, I read that you had a lot of different jobs yourself. Can you do you want to start off by talking about that? I mean, not many. I, the main thing I was in the beginning when I started to play poker, I did delivery guy. No, uh, because oh, yeah. like you know, especially in in the beginning, you lose you lose uh, your bank. Actually, I never really lost all my bankroll, but but you know, like uh, if I had to play live or whatever, I used to play and uh, I used to do side jobs as well because like I had to support myself and I was alone. Then after I started to work as a dealer, as well, uh, it was a mix, you know, like when I had money and I could play, I would play, and when I had to work as a dealer, I would work as a dealer. So always a mix. And then I remember his switch when I was 16, maybe 17, and I was like, okay, I just want to play. And I started to put a lot of volume, both online and live, even though online was quite difficult to put volume because I didn't have an internet connection. I didn't have a good computer. It was broken. I was living by myself, so I couldn't afford to buy it. So it was like a lot of challenges to just open Everest poker back in the days and start to play. Then I remember I got the Poker Strategy 50 box. You remember those? Like that yeah. you could do, like there was like this promotion that you could do a poker test and then they would give you 50, 50 bucks as a bankroll. And uh, I re many guys started from that. You know, my, me, Ole, also Ole got that 50 bucks. Like we all laugh about it. You know, 15 years later, we're like, you know, I got this 50 bucks from Poker Strategy. And we're like, ah, me too. You know, <laughs> so yeah. And then well, when I was, when I turned 18 is when I started to play also the live circuit. And, you know, I, I also been lucky in a way that I was so lucky to be alone and like don't have family support, don't have anybody, but at the same time, you give me a lot of freedom really early and they could really focus and go 100% on that. And I took that decision really early. So it was all, at the end of the day, it was all for the best. Uh, and would you say it, would you say, I mean, it sounds like it was really the best route to go. It just sounds like it was really tough. It was, it was like, uh, you know, you, you go broke so many times because at the same time you need money to live and it's not like just right. bankroll there. But at the same time, I always, I really always focus on developing a skill set. I never was really money oriented. I never really wanted fancy stuff or like anything like that, but just becoming better and better. And then at the end of the day, you know, when you develop a skill set, it doesn't matter. Like you can go hard time, you can go broke, but you can always level down and build it back. And that was like maybe the biggest, the good thing I did really early was always just be focused on developing a skill set. And at the same time, I really liked uh, probably like uh, you go with your personal experience, go through spots, trying to figure out the problem solving. And that I was obsessed with that. You know, I was obsessed with like, uh, really, like I would mistake a hand, I couldn't sleep and think about this hand in every single scenario for like four hours and it's just the way I was and like that was probably the biggest, the biggest, the good thing that happened to me that uh, I always focused on, just focus on developing a skill set and even when I started to win good because when I was 19 I, I really crushed the Italian tournament but I, it wasn't never enough, I was like okay I need to get better, I want to go I want to move outside and play .com and there was the first guy to do it, uh, the first Italian guy to do it. So, you know, it was always like a bigger challenge, a bigger challenge, a bigger challenge and, you know, it worked out. It sounds like you had like a growth mindset, you, you didn't care too much about, like, you're just trying to survive and uh, make more money, basically. It, it wasn't, I wasn't really drive with money, to be honest, I always felt like, my, my drive was like being able to, I don't know, when I started to play, for example, my dream was to play a EPT main. It was my dream because I had a friend of mine, he qualified with the steps when I was 16. And I was like, wow, you know, 5,300 euros, is so much money. Like I could never afford that. I wish one day I can play one of these main events. It's like my dream, you know, and, uh, and nothing like it, it just work out. Like, I don't know. I just, and I, at the same time, it was, it was weird because, uh, I don't know. I remember I bought, Harrington, you know, I bought the books with the 
VIP store, whatever. I remember I read maybe 15 pages of this and I was like, wow, this guy doesn't understand nothing. And I throw the book. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I want to do it my in my way. My way is better. I was like, wow, this guy folds ace nine suited from the cutoff. He doesn't understand. <laughs> so he was like, yeah, but funny. Those were really the days. Now we're all like cold calling all kinds of crazy stuff with the antis and all that stuff. I yeah, I didn't know uh, your you your beginnings were so uh, challenging. It does seem like uh, it would be really hard to try to make sure that all your needs are met and all that while trying to grind the hot, grind to get. To higher and higher stakes, I think that would be really, really stressful. My needs wasn't match. Like you know, a lot of time I would choose between I wouldn't eat. You know, I wouldn't like it was like really I would. It happened. I would be just focused into playing and would not eat for two days because I just want to play. And I was really fat, so it wasn't a bad thing. You know, I lost seventy kilos from that peak. But uh, I don't know. For me, it was like uh, I was so driven and I just wanted to play. And I played more than anyone else for sure. And I was playing. You know. 14 hours a day, every day, and just uh, trying to get better, get better, get better. And uh, also you need to find yourself, you know, you need to, because I grinded heads up and then I grinded sit and goes and I grinded catch games and I grinded a lot of tournaments. And I remember at one point I was like, okay, like I should focus on tournaments because it's what I enjoy more. And I think what I'm more talented at, and I took that decision, but uh, you know, like, especially for us back in the days, like, you needed to develop an all-around skill set, and it was very common that you would play heads up, and you would play six max, and you would play cash game, and you would play everything. I was guess I had a guess that your name Lasagna mm, came from came from because you were so hungry. No, 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 no. Actually, Lasagna is my favorite dish, but it doesn't come from that. Uh, I remember one of the best Italian poker players. Uh, he opened like a fast food chain of lasagna in Rome near the Colosseum and he called lasagna and uh, you know he was a friend of mine and they wanted to support him in some ways and they really liked it and they was like okay I mean, it, uh, the place was lasagna and I was like okay I'm gonna call myself lasagna and uh, yeah that's where it come from <laughs> why not um, very Italian I do think it's worth noting that I think a lot of the top professionals did grind these kinds of hours in order to get really good at the game and it does kind of come down to figuring out what to focus in on and then doing it. I've been having a bit of that issue myself, um, or remembering it now, I should say. Yeah, I mean, that really is the surest way to get to success, is just putting in all the hours and busting yeah. your ass, really. But yeah. I still think, going back to the point of where I think poker kind of is becoming more of a dream job, if you think about it, because these days... A lot of people go to college, uh, you know, they work four hours, that, or excuse me, four years, and put in a decent amount of hours, and then they've got all these debts that they got to work out, and they don't remember anything, and no, can't I mean, necessarily get a job or make more than high school graduates. I mean, for me, in school, there is only two options. Or uh, you really go for it, and you are really talented, and you know, you take it hundred percent. You go Ivy League, and you get a good job, and you know, that's one way. But everything you know, in the middle is. Like you, you get the silver spoon. Get your parents to pay. You know, forty thousand. That's what it was when I was applying. It's like forty thousand a year to go to an Ivy League school. People can't do that. Like, yeah, I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't uh, even three thousand a year. I couldn't. So, like, I understand. But you know, it's. Uh, I saw. I have friends that they went that path and they're really successful now. Uh, I mean, like few. Actually, few of my friends that really did that path, they got full scholarship. So they were really, you know, hundred percent on it since the young age, and that is a good way to do it. You know, but that is more a lot on your parents. You know, a lot uh, they give you. Right. I would say education plays a big part, like uh, teach you the way to study also is a big part, the way to well, ma people maximize are that more and more because people are realizing what that more than more is that you have to teach the way to, to study and yeah, technology yeah, yeah. and education system is kind of messed up. Yeah. I mean, the education system is super fucked up because at the same time, at least for Italy, for always how I see it doesn't really, uh, I don't know. Uh, 
pay for the effort, you know, a lot of time for so many years. I, I was really good at school when I was a kid. Like I win math games, like I was very talented in many different things, but I don't know, just the idea to be there for like 15 years and then finish. And you know, like if you become a lawyer in Italy, you don't make millions, you make 1.2K euro a month, like 1.3, like it's a AI normal job. You know, so I was like, okay, I probably can spend better these 10 years to put myself in a situation where, you know, in, in 10 years time, I'm in a better spot. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, um, that's well. one thing about poker is like, a lot of these problems don't really exist. It's more like different kind of problems exist where you got to handle your own shit or you lose your money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a little bit different than school. Well, it's like the opposite, but they kind of like, just lead you down the wrong, well, lead you down a path that's kind of like a spur, a pur, what's the word, a pyrrhic victory of sorts, whereas poker is more like the, the harder way in many ways, but once you get there, now you're free, and you can do whatever you want, I mean, but you still need like some kind of talent for poker. I mean, I on this, uh, I'm not sure 100%, because, for example, I teach at people, that I would say they didn't have good talent for poker, like the normal talent that you see. Like, for example, I don't know, you yeah. have a mathematical mind, uh, and that's help, help for sure. But I teach some guys that they didn't have that. They didn't have that, and they, they became good winners. But I focus on other abilities of them. Like, for example, they were good with people. Uh, they were good, uh, oh, really? you know, like, yeah, yeah. I had, I had a few guys that I coached that, you know, I tried to explain them the math for like a year. They didn't get it. And then I was like, okay, let's change approach. Let's focus on, okay, the guy is lying to you or not. You feel comfortable in the hand. Just, you know, play a clean strategy. And they won a lot. Most of the guys, it would be a completely different approach. But I had two guys that, uh, I don't know, like I would explain a concept, uh, you know, for four days, the same concept. And then the fifth day, he would make me a question that he didn't understand the last five days. And, you know, I went through this for like a year. And then I was like, okay let's change approach let's do something different with you because like it's clear like it is not the right approach with you well that's really interesting because i wasn't so sure that certain people could succeed if they can't understand these concepts frankly i, I would have guessed that it's more of being having an analytical mind um but that helps solve the question of like how to teach people that you know don't necessarily aren't particularly good at this kind of thing and somehow you're able to teach these people not being someone i mean maybe you are good with people maybe maybe you have that skill also no that for but sure i think i have that skill otherwise uh, like i'm very empathic for sure and i don't know i've been in any situation in life like the poorest the richest whatever and i think on that it is also i put a lot of my game into that you know like on specific situation where you have to go out of line and uh, often it's like it comes from your gut feel or whatever, and I trust that a lot in some sense, you know. Uh, uh, okay, so maybe you are equipped to teach this kind of stuff to, to people. Um, it doesn't, it just doesn't seem that easy, and it's a bit of a different path. I, I would think that someone needs to understand the concepts at the highest level, or do you not think so? Do you think... At the highest level, it's completely level? different. I mean, at the highest level, for example, to compete in a 25K, and to compete, to compete at the highest level means like having a good edge in this field. Uh, you have to be have so many talent and so many years put it in the game, and like you know, it's completely different. But it's the highest level. Uh, what they say is like for someone to beat, for example, a EPT main is different. You know, for someone to beat a I don't know main event who's up is different. Like you can focus on other stuff, you can focus on other skill set, you can focus on other specific situations, but, you know, to beat a 25k high roller, like, there is no shortcuts. You're going to go compete with the best right. in the world, and if you're not one of the best in the world, you're losing money. So, okay. even though, you know, there is some spot, there is whatever, but when you're final table for left, where you make the most money, you, you need to be one of the best, or yeah. it's not, uh, yeah. you know, it's not, uh, it's not cool. Uh, yeah, story checks out. Right. Hey, yeah, I don't think there's any, like, I don't think everyone's got that in them, but maybe can actually win at poker. And, like, maybe it's really solvable for that reason. But I want to uh, I want to talk a little bit about something else. Like, you've got a reputation for being a bit of a fun and crazy guy. And I, I, I'm curious, uh, I've seen a little bit, of it, but although 
Uh, apparently, you've got some crazy stories, and uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's. Uh, you think you've got that reputation? Yeah, I mean, it's just myself. I, I mean, the guys who played with me a long time, they know, like, I can be bluffing in any single situation. Like, really, like, you know, you can be betting 101k and they can be jamming 102k as a bluff, and they did it many times. So it's not the, like, it's just the, the way I see the game is a bit different. Uh, I don't know, like, I always uh, focus on my personal experience, on my personal, I don't know, like, spots where I feel like I'm very comfortable with, like, even to run a big bluff or, you know, like, or just a hero call often is, like, really spots that I feel comfortable to take. So, I don't know, I just try to, you know, be a crazy guy is good. Like, you know, you you are uh, Dragon Ball sometime in one tournament, Dragon Ball, in another tournament, you are the Triton, you know, like, it, uh, it's a good thing. Being crazy and different is a good thing. Then, uh, you know, like, also, we live in a, in a poker world that is very, I don't know, monothematic. Everyone is the same. Everyone has a similar yeah. story, even if it's different, you know, yeah. even if it's uh, yeah. one guy born in Italy, another guy born in Spain, but it's, you know, very similar stories of very often is like uh, guys that found the game really early, that put everything in the game, that dedicate 10 years of their life into the game, and uh, they develop the skills so that they can compete at the highest level. And uh, these are all different goals, you know, like uh, for many different reasons. Like, I don't know, I yeah, can think yeah, about sure. 15 people, 20 people that, uh, you know, when you ask me who's the best in the world, I cannot say okay. one name. There is like probably 15, 20, 25, they turn. And, you know, like one year it's going to be one because he run a bit better and another year it's going to be another one. But like, you know, like it's all people that dedicate everything to the game and made more sacrifice yeah. being on the road for 350 days a year. I, I didn't have a home like from probably 16 till 20. I I just really? had a backpack. Yeah, I would stay at France. Like I would be poker tournament after tournament. And then I finished to play live. I would go home, play online every day for two months, then mix it up. So it's, uh, but yeah, I like to be the crazy one. I mean, in a way, but good crazy. You know, there is bad crazy. There is good crazy. I'm good crazy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta be on the good side. That's, that's the ideal. There's only one craziest Italian poker player. Uh, as far as I'm aware of, maybe Dario is crazy as you. Uh, no, Dario is there's... cool. There is many uh, crazy Italian guys you don't know. Oh my God. Uh, there is so many, bro. You miss the Italian poker tour. Yeah. I know so many guys that are out of the moon. Like, really. I'm uh, I'm the most normal guy compared to them. What? Yeah, yeah, for real. I know so many, like, crazy, but crazy. Like, crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, what's the craziest thing you've ever done at um, in a poker situation? What, Or maybe, like, a crazy bluff you pulled at that, you know, was it a final table and you're just laughing about it? Ah, I don't know, it happened many times, because also, I'm one of these guys that, you know, like like you, I would say, I uh, I wait for my spot. Like, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not like one, two, three, and okay, I run a crazy bluff because it's, it's a crazy bluff. I usually get enough information, and like, been playing with someone for a really long time, always, I'm often perceived as way tighter than I am, too, because, uh, you know, like, I don't get into situations that I don't like. But then I'm capable to, you know, float you, call a four bet and float you out to a position with queen high and then bluff you on the river. Or I'm able to, you know, like when I feel, you know, it's, it's a mix. It's like tactical, but at the same time, it's a feeling thing. At the same time, live, you have so many different reads. Uh, I don't know. Also, I like to switch strategy often. You know, I can, I like to go super crazy, then tight, then crazy, then tight, then you know. Uh, as a sure. basic, uh, playing a good tag, I think is very important. But then you deviate yeah. on on every single situation. You know. Well, yeah, you, the, a lot of situations require different things. That's one hundred percent true. I mean, if you can adapt to different situations, which requires a certain kind of, it require that's kind of tough to do. Actually, that, a lot of a lot of people will not be able to do that. Um, to be able to one identify the situations and two figure out what you have to do to counter the situations and then three pull the f trigger and actually do it. I mean, there's a yeah. three yeah. not easy things to do together. Also, I never um, uh, you never feel regret if you put the other guy in a tough situation. Like if you the other guy, you know, think about four minutes to call you with a fucking topair that is a standard call. It means like okay, like okay, I can do this bluff again. Let's see, like uh, you know. Let's put him in the spot, you know, like, it's not a, there is nothing bad in it. 
as long as there's a little sweat in there, it's uh, yeah. worth it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, it's, it's a big part of the game, is why I love it, you know, like, at the same time. You tend... I, I want to talk about a couple hands that I've, yeah, I've seen. Yeah, sure. I want to talk about a King Jack hand, King Jack of Clubs hand, maybe this rings your bell, mm -hmm. and also a uh, Queen Nine suited hand that I, I've seen. Yeah, this, uh, you like called a four bet, and I guess the guy checked the, the this ace, eight, eight flop. There's a, there's a four no, bet, he bet. Flop. raise, re raise, yeah. re raise, call, queen, nine suit is in there. Um, and this ace, eight, eight flop. Why'd you do it? Uh, to be honest, because uh, already pre flop, I, I had, you know, I thought that he would make a bigger sizing with ace king. Uh, at the same time, on the flop, I thought he would consider check back with aces. He didn't have eight, any eight, and uh, I I just felt that often he had like kings, queens, jacks, this kind of hands, and it would be really hard spot for him. And I, at the same time, the way he bet the flop, I saw some weakness. And uh, pre flop, uh, pre flop, the thing I played with him for like you know really long time and. Uh, I'm always that guy that, you know, you play with me and he feels like I'm tight. Like the guy was thinking I was tight. This is the reality. Even though, you know, I was for sure the most active at the table and I was doing a lot of different things. But at the end, for, when he forbade me, I saw room to win it, you know, even though I, I don't know, I thought I was crushed, but I don't know, I saw room to win it against him post flop. And uh, and then on the flop I saw some weakness and I thought okay I'm, I'm just gonna float him and if he goes as a plan anyway you know the sea bet was more than if he goes as a plan I'm just gonna run a big bluff on the river and and I was comfortable with that play then you know theoretically it's not the right play theoretically it's like a fold to four bet and I know that it's not about uh, I don't I know like uh, it's not uh, it's not about that but sometimes you need to be able to deviate and I just felt that that hand. I I will I was able to win it way more times post flop than than actually I should have. This is why I call. Well, yeah, I mean his hand is a bit weaker. Well, he did have queens, so that the theory not so clear. But to be fair, it is a really annoying spot with a lot of pocket pairs. He has like mm -hmm. jacks, queens, kings. Yeah. And then and the occasional yeah. queen on suit floats like not so crazy to spot to spice in there. At the same time, uh, to be yeah, honest, theory. like I have all my ace kings are still in the range, ace queen are still in the range, some ace jack are still in the range. So it's not, uh, you know, ace king. It's it's fine to call pre flop the four, but you don't need to broke in that situation with ICM and everything. So my range was really strong, my perceived range. So I was like, okay, you know, like, and I played with him for so long, I never really took many spots like three bet and stuff super polarized and even though i was in control in the table but you just felt right and i went with the play okay yeah i mean it's it's reasonable queen knight suit is just like i'm like a little bit more choosy in these spots uh yeah. because it can get pretty improbable if you start adding too many combinations yeah you, i mean it's not like, the standard way i play queen nine you know of course like yeah. uh, sometimes i call yeah. small blind sometimes i use it as a you know, as a three bet bluff can be, and it's not like a three bet call four bet all the time with queen nine. It's just that in yeah. that specific situation, I felt I I really could win it a lot of time post flop. In many run out, he wasn't able to make the big hero call, and I yeah. just felt like he was the right play, the right guy to go with this play. Sure. Well, what about this King Jack suited hand against Charlie Correll? You, I think he three bet. You called the flop was ace. Eight five six. Uh, he bet you call. Mm. The turn was like a seven. I remember this hand. It, he checked you bet. Yeah. Which normal. There's a flush call. Yeah, yeah, he, he called, called and then the river I value bet the jack, right? Yeah, you value bet the jack, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you gave that. the speech play. You were, you know, um, chatting him up and yeah, having a nice little friendly conversation on the road. Yeah, I remember. I remember that. I don't know. It's, it's weird to explain. You know, like it's this situation when uh, you define your opponent range really well, and I don't know. I know it's not supposed to value bet there. You know, like I know that I'm not. I mean, turn uh, flop is fine. Turn is fine. Like nothing, nothing to question. Pre flop is fine. 
but uh, the value bet on the river is was just I felt like he was you know calling ace highs a lot on the turn, and I felt like uh, he know that I had range advantage on that texture, and on the river I felt that my jack was good and they should have value bet and I went with the play. It's hard to explain, you know, like it just. You go through situations a lot, and I played a lot with Charlie, and he's a really good player, capable to make a sick hero call with ace high or whatever. So he's he's one of these guys that I like to, you know, have a bigger value bet range and a smaller uh, bluffing range on that situations and whatever. And then as played, it's easy, you know. But at the same time, it's not that easy to to be able to, you know, value bet that. And at the same time, if you don't value bet that, then you're not getting, you know, like then the play is not as good because you should get more money when the jack comes and you just felt right to value bet there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say the flop is a fold, personally. Mm -hmm. Well, the machine would say it's a fold, too. So the flop's really spicy. Yeah. The river, I can see being a bet. Like, yeah, I, the guy calls tons of his highs and you know, calls his pocket tens and... Yeah, he does, for sure. He might bet tens, tens too. But I think he calls. Check calls more often, yeah. yeah. There is yeah, one I thick, mean... thick hand you never saw, actually. This was crazy. What's that? What's he was that? a hero fold. He was a hero fold. Uh, that was mm -hmm. insane hand. Against uh, against Ole. In the final table of the 100k. In Who? Monaco. Ole Shemian. Ole Shemian. Oh yeah, that guy. He's, yeah, a, so he's a Greek or not Greek player, he's a German player. German, yeah. Sure. yeah, he's really good. He's uh, especially in tournaments, I really like his game. So he opened under the gun and uh, yeah, Igor three bet the bottom, but I had a read on Igor. Like uh, the way he three bet he I saw some weakness, whatever. And uh, I was a uh, big blind in position with like a whale that was small blind. That is a is a big thing, you know. Especially on that final table, because I always felt like I had good spots, you know, blind war with the whale, so I didn't want to give away, give away, you know, that spot for my tournament life. Whatever, I have pocket queens from the small blind. I mm -hmm. bet it was like uh, 100k, 3 bet uh, 350, I forbet uh, 910 from the small blind, goes back to Ole, and he jammed 2.7 million. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, he comes back to me, and I have like 3.5, 3.6, and I folded pocket queens. Mm -hmm. and, uh, That's yeah, pretty I, crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not insane. It's it was not... uh, it was quite crazy because especially my history with Ole, it was quite crazy. But I got a good read that he was super strong. He didn't have a decision. This was the big thing. Like uh, he was in a spot that for him wasn't a decision, and he just jammed after like you know one minute, whatever. Where uh, he would have been a decision with Ace King off suited at least for me. I would you know like I would consider folding in that spot. And I don't know all the information told me like probably I was beaten, probably had kings or aces, and I had good 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 table. I had position on uh, really good seed draw, and I felt like I would make you know top three or heads up way more often by folding compared to calling and play the spot. So I just folded. It was like 28 bigs effective or something like that. But that was a sick fold. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Especially with ICM considerations. I think I could see it being really reasonable. Like you don't exactly want to get in. Either of you really want to get in money with like Ace King there. It's like kind of lousy. Yeah. I, I want to also talk about, you mentioned you went... Uh, you went broke in 2000, or when you were 21, and you made like a lot of bad of bad investments. I know we talked about, uh, what was it, this black coffee, black sheep. No, coffee. that's a, that's a great investment, actually. <laughs> oh, I didn't say that was a bad one. I said that was a good one. I, I was just curious about the lessons you learned and what kind of mistakes you made, because I, I myself made a lot of bad investments, too. I mean, for me, honestly, most of the time, like, I just focus on poker. Like, uh, when I went broke, too, was, uh, no, was one investment outside poker, uh, but it was, like, more of a loan that I had to get back, uh, paid back, but I didn't get paid back, and, you know, it was a big chunk of my money that I couldn't couldn't play the stakes I want, I couldn't play online as big as I want, and you know, then they paid me back so so little for a month, so I didn't have a bankroll, and that was a big mistake. But uh, then later on, later on actually, I started really to study more about investments, and like, uh, and Black Sheep came later, when actually, mm -hmm. I don't know, I felt uh, I developed a better skill set on understanding businesses. And I found that 
I, I kind of wish I didn't do this. I mean, I did the right thing a lot. I got screwed in some really annoying ways. Feels like I got screwed in ways that were kind of impossible to see at some point or very difficult to see. I, I did fix a number of my mistakes, but the biggest thing that I learned really, to be honest, no, is not sense. really go too wild with private equity investments and just invest in like kind of basic things a lot. I mean, Bitcoin was decent, but like it, it was the problem with Bitcoin was it's so wild and unpredictable. Um, like I kind of wish I just like threw a lot of money in like some basic stock market. I mean, to be honest, uh, if you if you don't know and you make good money from poker, like the reality is the money you make, like you don't want to take variance from it. Like uh, you already make a job that you deploy capital all the time at the variance. So, you know, when you hide and keep one and a half million bank, or just an example, uh, then I really see merit on just buying the SAP 500 and make 8% a year on average eight and a half. And you know, like being. I don't think it makes eight you know, percent like, a year. He does. I think uh, the overall was eight. Seems On the last hundred, hundred years time, I think eight percent. Really? Yeah. Seems like yeah, pretty decent actually. Like yeah, it is decent. It is decent. Yeah, this is why people say buy. I mean, after you leave uh, inflation and everything, you're making four percent net or whatever. Now even less, but. Uh, it's, uh, I think he, the, the return was like 8% over the last 120 years. At the same time, you know, you went through World War, you went through World War II, you went through anything, and that's the return. But at the same time, today, you can just buy, you know, bond at 4%. Like, so, it, I don't know, it depends what you're looking at. At the same time, for me, I always felt like the younger you are, the more risk you should take. But it's personal, you know, everyone is different. Yeah, well, I mean, it depends if you have kids and things like that, too. You have to adjust your investment also for me, strategy, it was a big your bank pool strategy out of life. As with yeah. in poker, it's like a part of it. Yeah. Similar, similarly, you have to, like, think about ICM in life. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, no, it is, uh, it is a big thing. Yeah. Also, like, uh, you need to... I don't know, like, at the same time, the money you invest is money that you don't see. Like, it's money that is gone. Like for you need to think that you, you lost it for like the next ten years. It is you know? true. It's not money, you're but, right. You know, in, you don't see that money for a long time. In one year, so like, that's you're not. You sh yeah, you should think that you're not gonna see that money ever again. Actually, but uh, you know, if you buy the S&P 500, no, like it's a liquid investment. Yeah, I mean that's in private equity though. That's not an S&P 500. S&P 500. You just take it no, out. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's I mean, a private that's equity. Equity matters a lot. A private equity or even a house. You know, when you buy, everybody think, oh, I buy the first house is a great investment. In reality, it's a liability. Like you buy your first house, probably you're not going to rent it. You're going to live in it. And uh, he, he brings you a cost. And, you know, like he, he just take out cash flow from you oh, every yeah. month. So it's, uh, you know, like it's not, uh, depends. Then if you tell me, oh, in 10 years, then that, yes, that is an investment. That makes sense. But I don't know, a lot of people that just, you know, they bink, uh, they win half million, and then they buy a house for 200, 250K. Like, the, in reality, okay, you're safe for the rest of your life, but you didn't make an investment, but you did a liability. Yeah, and there's a lot of nuances to making these kinds of investments that people don't really think about. It's really more complicated equation than, than it appears, especially when you're like, I mean, the house isn't the worst because it, like, you know, the, the, all capitalism, all yeah. money is net, you know, less than zero sum where that's not true about a house but yeah you're right you're not gonna like make much money from it you're gonna have to figure something else out you have to like if you buy like an apartment rent it out like i bought a couple condos in vegas and that was those were pretty good for the most part or at least things that you could rent out um that worked out pretty well yeah i looked uh, i looked actually to the that apartment like five years ago to be honest i was close to buy one but then it was like, well if you get the stuff on the strip yeah. the the stuff in, you, in these situations you need to get the stuff that's like in the parts of the land that is not going anywhere um i don't have a ton of time today but uh yeah, I don't have too much time now, but I do want to hit you with a couple rapid fire questions to see how you handle it. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready, right. I'm ready, Jungle. Right. I'm ready, Jungle. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Favorite <laughs> snack. My favorite snack? Uh, pizza. All right. <laughs> Karaoke song. Yeah. Karaoke song. Yeah. Uh, mm, wow. Oh, oh my God. You said you were ready. Know, some, 
something in English. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, ah, uh, Bon Jovi. Something from Bon Jovi. Living or a player. Come on. Something right. like this. All right, all right. That's a pretty good answer. Um, let's see. Shit, maybe I'm not ready. Uh, best lesson you learned? Best lesson to not always listen to jungle. Oh. <laughs> all right. I didn't expect that. Right, always the, listen to the jungle. All right. What's the title of your autobiography? Uh, wow. Uh, think out of the box. Think out of the box. All right. Yeah. That's a pretty good one. Should, uh, I'm curious what kind of things. Um, well, along those lines, uh, best lesson that took you a while to learn? Bankroll management. I still didn't learn, but yeah, bankroll management. I think it makes a big, big difference uh, on, uh, on the long term, especially in poker. Uh, every time you read, but in reality, it's like uh, what you learn in poker, you bring also in uh, real life. Like this is why we are uh, so privileged, because poker teaches so many lessons in the years. Mm -hmm. And often if you can apply this lesson to the real life, like you, you're going to end up on top. And we have so many examples of great, good poker players that, you know, they stopped to play poker, they moved into something else, and what they learned, like, they they put it in place in something else, and they did really well. Yeah. Uh, this actually reminds me of a story where you played in a million-dollar buy-in in Manila. And, you know, a long time ago. And I, I think me and, like, some other players were a bit conservative, and, uh, you know, like maybe we're, but we're taking aggressive shots of sorts, like having 20% or something like that. I forget. Yeah, I had 20. I had 20 and Dario had 20. We oh, shot, really? yeah, we had 20 each year. I, I think 23 and 20, something like that, yeah. Well, but I didn't expect it would have been this big because when we started, it was smaller. And then he got okay. bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But yeah, yeah it was fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I just remembered you were like kind of YOLOing pretty hard on the, the bankroll. Thing in this. It wasn't honestly. It wasn't too bad, like because I use good spots and you know, like uh, especially it can bring more upside because you know if you do good in these games, then there is more games and it's a situation that is worth a shot. And I always been, I don't know, if it's a place that uh, I feel like uh, I have a good edge and like there is a you know there is a good uh, good game and like there is a big upside in the long term. I never been scared to take shots and I think it's. Uh, it has to be like, I don't know, you should never be scared to take big shots. And at the same time, I was coming from, you know, two or whatever, three, four amazing years. And, you know, we both speak, me and Daria, and we were like, okay, let's take a shot on this game. And it is what it is. I think something that people are scared often is to take shots. And I think you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. You should put yourself in situations where uh, to take smart shots like you should. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that, in my opinion, was a smart shot. Well, if you take your shots, you'll miss quite a lot, but eventually, if you learn, you'll get there in theory. Yeah. Well, anyway, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Django, it was a pleasure. Let's do it again. And congratulations for everything, your podcast. I watched uh, the other day the True Tiger one. It was really good. It was really good. Yeah, I love Timo Fey. Thanks. Yeah, you do. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting guy. So are you. And anyway, yes, thank you for having, for being on and uh, showing the world, yeah, showing the world the craziness, your craziness and yeah. special thoughts. I need to figure out the other nine games, so I'm going to come challenge you one day in your tournament. When are they going to change All the right. name to the Jungle Invitational from the Cheap Read? All right, I really hope both those things happen. <laughs> Both of those things would be amazing. Anyway, see you at Mustafa. Oh, thank you. Huh? Take care, guys. Ciao. All right.